Welcome to the Circuit of Success Podcast. The Circuit of Success Podcast. With your host, Brett 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 Gilliland. Brett Gilliland, Visionary Web Advisory. The Circuit of Success Podcast. Let's start the show. Welcome to the Circuit of Success. I'm your host, Brett Gilliland. Today I've got Lasser Sorensen with me. Lasser, how you doing? I'm good. It's good to see you. Yeah. I've uh, I was turned on to your story by uh, David Sink, who then told Ryan Barkey, and you know how that how it goes, mm-hmm. right? And then I I read this amazing article uh, about your restaurant in Desoto, Illinois. Uh, you've had it for twenty five years. Twenty six years, yeah. So I I started my career in California. I, I moved from Copenhagen, Denmark, to California, and I I lived in Los Angeles. And after ten years out there, I I decided I wanted to live in a different place with less people that I was used to from back home. So Southern Illinois actually reminded me somewhat of Denmark's rolling hills and small little farming communities. Yeah. So it was a good spot. And uh, everybody told me there's no way you're going to make it. People are not going to appreciate it. All they eat is barbecue and catfish. <laughs> and, you know, so I I consider that it was a it was a victory that I was there for that many years. Yeah, heck yeah. And, uh, you know, all the people that, you know, were into meat and potatoes, you know, I got them turned from well done to medium rare. And <laughs> so it was a, it was a long, uh, it was, a, it was a, a long course of training a lot of people in eating what I wanted them to eat. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, I, you know, I got a lot of friends and uh, out of all these customers yeah. I met over the years. So this has been an, a wonderful 25 years so how did southern illinois even come up like when you're in california you know people in california don't know much about southern illinois obviously so how does that even happen well so my wife's uh, parents were in the military and they okay. lived all over the world but they were originally from the carbondale carterville area got it so got when it. they retired they retired in carterville okay so, uh, uh, you know, I was out here uh, to visit Mary Jane's family. Mary Jane's my wife. And uh, I went on a fishing trip on Crab Orchard Lake. Yeah. And I love fishing. <laughs> so I thought it was, it, it was great. And, and I, I really got enamored with the area. And then we were out one night and we drove by this old place. And, and uh, Mary Jane's brother said, well, this place has been here since 1921. It's a, a cool place. And... Uh, he says, you want to stop by for a drink? Yeah. So we went in there, and the owner was in there, and she was the only one that was in there. There was no servers, no nothing. You know, the lights were dim. You can tell yeah. that they, they were in dire straits. And we, we got to talk, and she got a divorce, and she wanted to get out of it. So I'm, I'm like, okay. So I went back uh, to California, and I said to my wife, what do you think about opening a restaurant in Southern Illinois? And she said, are you kidding me? I spent all these years to get out of the Midwest. That's the last place I want to live. <laughs> so another five years went by, and I worked for Corporate America and uh, you know, ran 13 restaurants and had a corner office and a great job. And, and, uh, and in today, actually, I was thinking if I would have kept that job, I would have retired by now, but <laughs> neither here nor there. I got bored because I love to do stuff with my hands, and I love to cook. So five years went by, and, and I... And I came out here again, and the restaurant was still for sale. And we made them an offer, and the they took it, and the rest is history. Yeah, that's amazing. What a cool story! And so you grew up in Denmark, and I read somewhere your dad was the pastry chef for the royal family. Is that yes. right? Mm-hmm. My gosh! So tell us about that. What was what was growing up in Denmark? Denmark like? What's made you the man you are today? Well, I mean, you know, what as you get older, I'm 57 now. You start thinking back on some of the lucky things you have happened to you you know as a kid growing up and the lucky thing i have happened to me is i had the same mom and dad and they were there the entire time when i was young and they taught me you know to be responsible and i was never you know i always thought it was strange and i saw other kids getting stuff and my parents were like no you gotta work for it and then we'll give it to you Mm -hmm. and and you know i realized later on in life that all of those things were just super, super important, uh, you know, and that's why I could do what I done is because, you know, my childhood was, was so good. And then of course, being in the restaurant family, my siblings are in the restaurant family, you know, so as soon as I could walk, you know, I was washing dishes and then I was helping my dad in, 
in uh, in the kitchen dipping cakes in chocolate and all that stuff mm. that's how i got my allowance and then it mm. you know after school then i had you know two or three hours that was my job so i could get money to do whatever i wanted to do so there, there was it was a great upbringing yeah. but it was a different time you know things were were different and and my dad were, he's passed away now he was a great artist meaning that for him being a pastry chef was being an artist to express yourself he would make uh, he made the biggest wedding cake in the world it's in the guinness book of record wow. and uh you know and then he made all the wedding cakes for the royal royal family and always looking uh, to do new and exciting things in his field so it was a great it was a great uh, um, uh what do you say um it was great for me to see somebody that was that devoted yeah. to his craft but then on the other hand, you know, if you wanted to talk to him about something else, there was nothing to talk about. There, he, See, he, I know pastry. Yeah, he, he, so my mom had to do that other side, but, uh, uh, you know, it was interesting. And I remember when I became an apprentice with him, you know, he would say stuff, and, and uh, I always thought, man, he's crazy. I mean, he's too hot. This is not going to work. Why does he say that? And... Uh, when I, when I got my first big job in California and I had 50 people under me in the kitchen, I start saying the same stuff he said. And I'm like, wow, <laughs> he was guy, right. Yeah. And he came over and visited me uh, when I had Tom's place. And I sat him down one day and I said, I apologize for not believing what you said, but it just took me 20 years to figure out yeah. why you said what you said. So it, it was... That's great. He was very happy to hear that, too. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> it takes us, us guys to wise up over the years. That I've yeah. had to have that conversation with my parents as well. So um, how, do you, how in the heck do you land a, a gig with the royal family? Do you know how that happened? Well, I mean, so in, in, in those countries, you see, like, uh, uh, certain stores that would have the crown over their name, and that's because you are the best in the country at one specific craft. Okay. So all the different crafts, there is one of them that has that. Wow label so and, it's, and it was him yeah wow good for him yeah. um and so in 1989 is when you moved to america and yeah. then like you said you came there um and so what what have you learned over the years and i don't know if you know you know why i came to america i don't well because i was involved in a movie in huh. denmark called babette's feast and they won an academy award as best foreign picture in 1988 wow. And uh, it was a very interesting movie. And uh, so the producers of the movie wanted to open a restaurant in La Cienega uh, in Los Angeles and call it Babette's Feast. And so we were all geared up to all come over here. And I was over here before anybody else. And then the recession hit okay. in 89 and they pulled the plug on it and everybody oh, wow. went home. And I decided, well, I think okay. I'm going to check this place out yeah. a little longer. Yeah. And uh the rest is history. That's why I've been here. So, so can long. we say you're an Academy Award winner? No. <laughs> He's like, no. Well, I mean, I had a hand in it. I was in the movie. I had I a hand in it. And, and yeah. the funny story with that was, you know, it was a considered back then a low-budget movie. Yeah. And it, it, I think they made it for like $3 million. And the, f the first year, they made $80 million. Oh. You know, when you win an Academy Award, that's just a landslide of money. Yes. So... I was young, and then they asked me, how do you want to get paid? Do you want to get a percentage of the movie, or you want to get mm. paid? And obviously, I did not make the right choice on that <laughs> one, because we were like, ah, it's a good movie, yeah. but no, yeah. it's, it's, it's not. It's not going anywhere. So then I did another movie with the producer later on called A Girl in the Swing, where I actually was much more involved in the food than on Babette's Feast, and they asked me the same question, if I want a percentage, and I said yes to that, because I thought, okay, that's a good decision, yeah. and it flopped. <laughs> so <laughs> over two in the movie making business. <laughs> yeah that's right and, and so it, but but it's interesting but for me it's like that was like the first uh time that that i was involved in making you know motion pictures and and here i am today with a show so uh, you know i kind of understand the whole thing about what you have to do in front of the camera yeah and when you when you cook, especially, you know, the food has to be done a certain way when it's for the camera and everything. So it's it, it's I guess all the little things have made me come to this point where I am today. So yeah. so I think that's a little what I hear there, too, is awareness. Right. So I, I don't think that's by happenstance that these little things just happen to get you to where you are today. You know, Master Chef, I did some I mean, eight day exam, 130 hours. 
uh, in all areas of cooking, right? To be a master mm-hmm. chef, which you are. And, and I think that when you put one foot in front of the other, I always say boringly consistent is probably what I would assume you've done over the years to get you to the level you're at. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I, I mean, it, it's it, it never, uh, I never thought of, of a job like, uh, how much money can I make and you know what's the hours and all that I always thought about everything I do in life has been about what can I learn from it and you know I've the not only cooking but I've done a lot of things other than cooking which I I can't explain to you today how I got into that I uh, like 15 years ago I started a construction company huh. and I started building houses and it came from the fact that I was trying to get people to do work in the restaurant and they did such a poor job, and I'm like, it's obvious you're gonna have yeah. to do it like this. So then, I started doing that, and I realized I was good at that too. And I can't kind of ran the construction company like a kitchen. Yeah, I wouldn't allow them to throw stuff, and you know, they they all looked at me like I was crazy because I want everything clean all the right. time. And before you go home, you clean everything up. Where that's not how they do it. No. So, but you know. You know, I, I was successful at that, I think, because, you know, I had a different mindset and, and I, I wanted people to have get, you know, value and quality. And I never understood why people would overcharge if they, you got really good at something. Why would you charge an exorbitant amount of money for something? Because it's just not right. So that's kind of how I, I've been thinking, you know, and, and same thing with food. You know, really, when people come to the restaurant, you know, I'm like, you know, I don't want to overcharge for anything, but then... On the other hand, you know, it's all about location. You know, if you're in Clayton, you can charge a bunch of money. If you're yeah. in DeSoto, Illinois, you can't. Right. So you you, you got to be aware of all those little intricate things that you have to make decisions on every yeah. single day. Yeah. So, so when you think about your career, you, you don't just become a master chef and stay there, right? And I think about the business world that I'm in, you're constantly having to work on your craft. So, Absolutely. So how did you stay a student of your craft and, and keep going to that next level? Well, so when I was uh, when I lived in in Copenhagen, and I was younger. I was very involved in competitions, and that you know I have a competitive side, yeah. and uh, so I was at the World Championships for pastry chef, uh, and my dad told me that I didn't train hard enough, so I wouldn't have a chance, and I won. <laughs> so that was a wonderful feeling, and then I've been on the culinary Olympic team of Denmark a couple of times, and I. I saw that the more money the teams have, the better the chances you have of winning. Mm. So that's kind of how I got out of it because, you know, I realized it was not about your skill level. I mean, if you if you had a huge sponsor behind you where you uh, can yeah. train every day and do all that stuff, so it was unfair. So, but then, uh, you know, there was other chefs like me that, thought well that's not a, a good way to do a competition it's better if we do like a like a mystery basket type thing because then everybody's on the same playing mm-hmm. field I so that. i i a- after that the whole thing i i kind of said well you know i need to just hone my skills somewhere else but it was a good experience to learn you know uh to do things faster and better and all that stuff on a competitive level but it was just you know prepping me for other things i guess and uh um you know the 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 greatest thing was you know i got to meet some very very interesting people i got to meet paul bocuse and i say that today and nobody knows who he is it's uh, he was the most famous chef in the world up until recently he passed away and uh you know he couldn't pronounce my name lesser he always said i should open a restaurant called lesser fair which means let it be Mm. So I always wanted to open a restaurant called mm. Lesser Fair. And then when I came to Southern Illinois, my wife told me, if you change the name from Tom's Place to Lesser Fair, they're going to shoot shotguns <laughs> through the <laughs> window. So maybe uh, it's still in the future. But anyway, he came over here and lo and behold, he came and visited me. So that was a huge honor. That, And uh, all the French chefs were very upset that, uh, that mm. he didn't go to just French chefs. But... You know, I had a good rapport with him, and and uh, you know, it it doesn't really mean a lot to a lot of people today. But for me, that was like meeting a culinary yeah. god, and it was just, I mean, just an amazing feeling that somebody actually remembered you and recognized yeah. you for your skill. 
So uh, that that was a so so walk through that if you can. So like let's peel the onion layer back because the, I'm, I'm assuming the guy didn't just call you and say, "Oh, you're the greatest in the world. I'm going to come over and see you in America." Right. So how did that happen? Like, how does that transpire? And and I'm thinking about the people that are listening to this right now, and they're maybe they're in sales or attorney, they're a financial advisor, whatever they're doing, but they're saying, okay, how do I build that deep relationship? How do I get that connection and then grow that relationship? So how did that happen for you? Well, I mean, I think first of all, that you're devoted to your craft and you, you are, you're at, at a skill level that, that only a few will get to by hard work. Mm -hmm. And I think that they recognize that. And then obviously you can break it down differently because other people, the Frenchman that didn't get him to come and visit them, they had another idea why he came to. Uh, he was uh, it was a champagne brand that that sponsored him. Okay. Well, lo and behold, the restaurant I was in, we bought more champagne than anybody <laughs> else. So I'm sure that had something to do with it. And uh, but you know, I think that uh, he recognized the fact that I went to Bocuse d'Or, which is a competition you have in France, yeah. and then he could remember because we had a long conversation when I was down there. And one interesting thing. Uh, when I went to France and saw him, I remember uh, Mitterrand was president and there was like 3,000 people. Everybody was talking. The president walked in. Nobody cared. Then Paul Bocuse walked in. Everybody was silent. And then when he said bon appetit, everybody sat down and ate. So that's kind of like where the respect <laughs> was yeah. back in the day. And you realize you were in, pr in the presence of somebody who were big, yeah. right? Yeah. Because the president couldn't get anybody to shut up, but this guy, he was just, he had an incredible aura around him that, Unbelievable. that, uh, so what, what's been your biggest learning as a lot of business owners listen to this, um, your biggest takeaways over the years, almost 26 years as a business owner, because I think there's a difference between being yeah. a chef and being a business owner, right? Uh, what have you learned, uh, over those years? Well, I mean, so the big difference is just like you said, when you're a business owner, and a chef, then you have to make decisions differently as when you work for somebody else. You know, when you work for somebody else, you want to just show your craft and skill or whatever, but all of a sudden, you're responsible for employees, taxes, and, uh, you know, the well-being of the building you're in, everything. And it is an enormous task to be a small business owner, an enormous task, and you have to be Fluid, constantly fluid, because every day something happens. Yeah, right. And so you, 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 you can't have a frame of mind that, you know, everything's going to be the same all the time. I mean, over the 25 years that I've been there, things have changed, and I just constantly adapted. Yeah. And, you know, if, if, if they raised the taxes, you had to do something to offset the cost somewhere else or new regulations. You constantly have to move, and if you're not interested in doing that, you're not going to make it. That's just how it is to be an yeah. entrepreneur. Yeah. And I think most um, entrepreneurs can can uh, agree with me that it, it's just that, it, I, don't, I don't know, it, some people call it a hustle, but I don't think it's really a hustle. It's just you, you have to acquire a skill set where you're good, uh, you, you have to be good at not only your craft, but you have to be good at a lot of different things. Yeah. And a lot of chefs fail because they're not good businessmen even though they're very, very well versed in making food, but that's not enough. Right. You, you have to, you know, like what I understood when coming to Southern Illinois is that I can't be serving raw fish on all the, the plates going out, especially not the first 10 years because yeah. my customers don't want that. Right. So I had to make some adapt, uh, adaptions to that. But, but you know, that, that, that wasn't really difficult. You know, you just gotta have to find your groove where everything works. Yeah. And then even that changes too. People's uh, opinion on on uh, what they should should eat has changed dramatically in twenty five years in the United States. So, and you you have to constantly change everything about your business so it follows with the trends there is. And you know, if not, you just get stagnant, and then people stop coming yeah. because you do the same thing over and over again. So talk about that. Uh, I'm a big believer in your vision. You ha you have to believe more in your vision than anybody else's doubt, right? So when mm -hmm. you when you think about, I can't serve fish uh, on my plate for the first ten years, um, but yet here you are, this master chef. You have a grand vision. You have a different thoughts of what people should be eating than we probably normally do. So what role did that play? Where where was the, like how did you get people to kind of step outside of their comfort zone in Southern Illinois? 
Well, so my vision for the restaurant never happened because I wanted the restaurant to be, you know, the first Michelin star restaurant. Uh, Michelin star restaurant. I don't know if people on uh, n- really know that there's a few restaurants like that, but there is a guide in Europe called the Michelin Guide, mm-hmm. and they rate the best restaurants. And and s- in Europe, you will drive five or six hours to come to a restaurant just to experience wow. the great cuisine. And I thought, well, you know, I'm two hours from St. Louis, five hours from Chicago. If if I if I uh, if I try really hard and put my mind and heart to it, I can make them come. And I did, you know, I did. But the given the economic environment in Southern Illinois, I wasn't able to, you know, have the finest china and the the best plates and. Uh, glassware and you know an abundance of servers it Mm -hmm. was just not economically viable like that's where you that's where you uh uh, you know that's what you see in michelin style restaurants i just could never get it there but i really wanted to and that was my vision for a long long time and then uh then you know obviously there comes times in 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 your tenure in a restaurant where you are in survival mode yeah so sometimes you know we we had years where we were in survival mode and then things got better again but my vision has always been serving the people the the best and the freshest ingredients and then that's the key to success yeah. and giving them great service you know and and I I I didn't care if you had overalls on or a, a suit and tie I will treat everybody the same when they come to my restaurant and and I thought that Southern Illinois at times were a little bit of a culinary desert so i wanted to be that little oasis yeah. and that was my business plan really that's uh it, it makes me think too I'm, I'm thinking about the uh the the vision that may not have happened right is 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 there more in the tank uh for you right so if, if that was once the vision does mm-hmm. that vision totally change or is that and you learn a new vision or have you or is it like i said there's still some something left in the tank that says that that michelin star deal i want yeah. that and, you know, like if somebody came to me and said, hey, we're a group of millionaires, investors, right. and we want we want you to continue. And I could put all the money and effort into doing that. I would yeah. love to do that. Yeah. I mean, the place has everything it that it takes yeah. to make that happen. It just needs an, an enormous influx of yeah. money. Right. And I would like to do that. But. Uh, you know whether that's going to happen or not, I'm not right. sure. But yeah. I still have plenty left in the tank. <laughs> I just got to figure out right. what what right. you know. What kind uh, of gas are we putting in the tank? Yeah, right? and I mean, I, I'm I'm really uh, you know like this has been five days in, and I've spent. Uh, I had uh, company from Denmark. My family was here from Denmark, so I've been cooking, and I love to cook. So a friend brought a bread machine. And I've been baking bread and stuff. I'm I'm still that person that yeah. I have to have something Can't turn to it do. Off. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to have a hard time turning it off. So I'm hoping that uh, that uh, I can use some of that energy uh, for something really positive. And, and I love helping other people. Yeah. But the question becomes, can I make a living off of that? That's what I don't know. But, right. you know, like I'm saying, I, I identify as an unemployed right now, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm just going to have to wait and yeah. see. I've, I've gotten six job offers, so my ego uh, is doing great. Right. And but they all require me to move to big cities yeah. and, you know, work in, 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 in hotels or some big restaurants and stuff. And, uh, you know, I'm 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 a little bit I'm uh, you know, I'm, I'm not really sure what I yeah. what I'm going to do yet. But but I think that says a lot about you, right? Yeah. A lot about your craft and what you've mm-hmm. done. And, and quite frankly, I think as a human being. I thought there's no way in heck after the last couple of weeks you've had the number of hours, the, the, the work that you've put in, the emotion you've put in. Yeah. When I said, hey, show up July 6th and let's do this podcast. And you're like, yep, I'll be there. I'm like, there's no way in hell this guy's coming. Right. <laughs> it has been a very, very tumultuous couple of weeks. And uh, my wife's been trying to talk me out of closing the restaurant because she she was thinking that it's a failure. And I'm like, what do you mean? It's it, it We're closing on our terms. Yeah. And we've been there for 25 years. It just means that, you know, I don't want to leave the place where I'm going to start doing stuff I don't want to do. Yeah. You know, to accommodate a different generation, casual dining and all that. I'm, I'm not knocking any of it. I'm just saying that for with my skills and my craft, 
you know, if if I have to step into a new position, it has to be something that excites me. Yeah. You know, where I can say, wow, now I may be, be able to do some stuff that I weren't able to do in, in Illinois or in DeSoto, Illinois. And uh, um, so we just kind of have to wait and see yeah. what, what happens. We'll wait and see. We'll be watching. Talk about the belief in self. Um, how important is that uh, for being great at your craft? Belief in self. And then if it's important, which I believe it is, uh, how, how do you improve on that? When you know the, the 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 one thing I think is very important is your mindset, and I've always had a positive outlook uh, on stuff, and that I mean that's the most important yeah. thing. But what do you have to do to have a positive outlook on everything? Right, you have to be in good health. You have to you know uh, know that you know you cannot change other people. I mean you you can only change what's within an arm's length. So there are certain things you have to think about as you're embarking on whatever uh, business uh, adventure you're in, but the mindset of being positive, I think leads to the same mindset that makes you successful. Because if you're not positive, if everything is negative, if you see everything as a strike against mm-hmm. you, then, I mean, you're going to have a hard time. You know, so w- when I when I'm dealing with people that that don't want to have an education and they, they are not interested in bettering themselves, you know, I'm thinking to myself, well, that's an opportunity for me mm-hmm. because I want to do it and I think I can do it. Of course I can do it. So, th- you know, you really have to just be very, very positive. And, you know, really money I- is really uh, not that important. You know, like as you grow older, you realize that, you know, you th- being in good health is is more important and being happy yeah. is more important than making a bunch of money. Right. So for me, it's never been about the money. I just wanted to be able to provide for my family and then, you know, drink some good wine and constantly cook some good food right. for everybody and make right. people happy. Everybody's happy. Yeah. I like, you know, it's funny. So I've been in the wealth management business for 22 years. It's all I've ever done, right? So I'm around money every day. I talk money every day. And... It, it's funny when you say your health and all that is is I compare your health and your wealth together, right? Because yeah. if you have the if you only focus on your health and never focus on any money, well, your health's probably going to go away because you're super stressed when you're old and you can't work and do yeah. all those things, right? And then vice versa, if I only focus on wealth and I don't focus on my health, well, guess what? Your wealth's going to go down because now you're spending all this money. Uh, you know, because you're I mean, sorry, you spend on your health, so you're spending your money on your health, right? And yeah. so I think that's important to know. And, and that's why I do the podcast, even though we're not talking finances mm-hmm. here today, it's help people, help people achieve a future greater than their past. We yeah. can learn from you. We can take away things from you and take away your 30 plus years of being in this, you know, master chef level. What does it mean to you when you hear the words, a future greater than your past? I mean, what it means, it means everything in the situation I am in right now, right? Yeah. You know, that, that's, that's, that's the, I'm going to harvest everything I can of the knowledge I've used in the past to create a better future for me now. But I also, all the things you just talked about right now is going to become really important to me because, you know, for the first many years, I didn't think about retirement and I thought the restaurant would be my retirement. Yeah. Well, now I'm sitting on a piece of property when I'm not there, it's not worth anything. Right. So how am I going to make up for all of those things. And that's why I, that's the task for me now is to figure out, well, you know, how I'm going to get out of this yeah. and, uh, and then still be able to do what I love to do. So I, I think if I could do it all over, I would probably have talked to a, a wealth advisor <laughs> in <laughs> yeah. the beginning, right. because then I would have had a retirement plan yeah. and all that stuff. It was always been the idea, of course, you know, somebody else is going to come along and buy the restaurant from an exorbitant amount of money. And then I'm going to just retire. That's right. Well, I mean, that's just not what happened. Yeah. So, uh, uh, and, and many, many years, you know, uh, I've had a lot of, uh, people in the finance business every time they had, uh, you know, uh, meetings and stuff in Carbondale. So they all told me the same thing. I mean, like, what are you doing for retirement? All that stuff. Do you have a 401k and all like, no, 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 no. The, so uh, it is super, super important. Yeah. A- and, you know, but on the other hand, I also see people that work themselves to death 
and you know they they retire and then they were sick for a couple of years yep and then they're done that's right they're gone and i don't want to be that person either so you know if if you're really smart you you think about that in early in life and you yeah. s- you know i always said to myself i want to retire at 50 yeah well now i'm 57 and it's not looking good <laughs> <laughs> but but uh you know I, and when i say retire it's not like i ever want to retire i always want to do stuff yeah. but it'd be nice to uh you know not having that financial stress over yeah. you all the yeah. time absolutely and i think you know any restaurateur actually has financial stress just because that's just part of the yeah, job part of the deal yeah. yeah but it's important to you know uh interact with people that i understand you know and, and and that's with all the skills you always have to be open to new things and realize that you know you got to listen to people that are good at at what they're doing yep. and then ask for advice that's very very important and you shouldn't be uh you shouldn't be afraid of asking for advice you you should be humbled by the fact that somebody are able to give you good advice yeah yeah, and I think that's so key. I don't want to just go right past that. I mean, the advice, getting advice is huge. I mean, yeah. I, I remember in, in still to this day, I'm well, hence I'm trying to learn from you today, right? I think we have to be humble enough to say, I don't know the answer to everything. Yeah. But there's somebody that's been doing something that you want to do for 30 and 40 years. Let's go steal their knowledge. I always say steal yeah. shamelessly, right? Yeah. Take that one idea away from you, apply it to your life, be humble enough to go out and do it. Right. So what I want to turn the page to now is, and it's, it's on your shirt there. Food mm-hmm. is love. Yeah. So food is love. This is a passion project for you. Um, yeah. Tell us about that five times Emmy nominated. Yeah. I mean, I, I would say I probably spent 25% of my efforts on food is love and it kind of fell into, I was, I was, uh, uh, I was invited out to a show in California uh, and I was on a big, big show out there and uh, somebody in the Midwest saw me and hmm. thought, well, he would be a great person to portray the food scene in St. Louis. And uh, he called me and I said, no, I'm not interested. I mean, the last thing I need is any more work, right? right? It sounded like a lot of work. And he c- was very, very persistent. And then we finally came to the agreement, you know, the show that he wanted, I didn't want to do that. And I s- he said, well, what's it going to take? And I said, well, if I'm doing a show, I want to do a show that, you, you know, I'm a chef. I don't watch cooking shows, and I hate to see cooking shows where, you know, a lot of them are made up. Yeah. You know, like, uh, and then you, see, you know, but people want to see aggression in the cuisine, uh, in the kitchen, and people throwing stuff at each other and yelling at each other. I mean, they, it's so far from reality for me that I'm not interested in anything like yeah. that. So, my show, and you know, I'm 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 blessed that PBS gave me the opportunity. My show is about. Uh, breaking down barriers for for uh, uh, you know f- for people that for instance uh, this is a good example Korean cuisine was my first restaurant that that I did and and mm. when people talk about Korean cuisine they go ooh that kimchi is terrible and I was unfamiliar with it too and and just he- hearing other people talking about kimchi I'm like yeah that must be terrible right and so I met a wonderful person, a Korean uh, chef that that uh, are in St. Louis, and uh, he was uh, the the pilot program, if you will. And the amount of things that I learned from one person following him mm. for three days, uh, I mean, that was really uh, it. It it opened my eyes, and I thought to myself, you know, I'm doing something right here because if I'm a master chef and I thought I knew everything about cooking, yeah. I know nothing about cooking, maybe a little bit, right. but all these different uh, uh, immigrants that comes into this country, and um, a lot of them are engineers and doctors and stuff, but they can't work like that. Their work ethic is just like mine. They have an incredible work ethic, yep. and their kids are brought up where they have to work in the restaurant after school. And all, I mean, it, it is it is so in uh, in touch with what I think uh, working in a restaurant should be. But when you taste the food of a different country, you know, it just takes you somewhere. It in- inspires you. It uplifts you. And you, you want to, not only do you want to try kimchi and you want to try Korean, Korean cuisine, you may even want to try to go to that country after you see it. So the food is kind of like the, and that's why I call it food is love is because 
once you put something in your mouth and it's fantastic, in my opinion, your heart opens up and you can talk to people that you normally wouldn't talk to because you start talking about the food and then the conversation can go in another direction. But all of a sudden you have something in common where today, you know, we are so uh, opposite on everything. So right. I was so tired of that whole dynamic of being opposites. I, th I thought to myself, we need something that brings us together. So that's really the, the basis for the show is to inspire and uplift communities through food. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we've done a really, really good job. Like you said, we got five Emmy nominations and I spent as much time on it as I could, but now I have different ideas and I want to try some new things uh, on the show. And I think that, uh, uh, that nothing has changed uh, in, in the philosophy of the show, but I think by me spending more time on it now, I think some of the things that I want to do, I have time to do now. So that's I'm going to definitely make time for that. So that thing will be growing. We'll be seeing yeah. more of mm -hmm. that at a high, high level, which is awesome. What um, what advice, so you said you're 57, what advice would you give the 37-year-old you? Talk to a, a financial <laughs> advisor. I promise I didn't ask you to tell him to say that. No, I know, but uh, really, I mean, and... Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, I think I could have been, you know, in a much better situation today if I had done that. I mean, I, I think uh, when you're in the height of your career, you don't think about those things. But I think you really need to lay a good foundation for the future. Yeah. I think that that's very important. And then I think also that you need to set yourself some goals on when you stop. And mm. I think that, uh, that, you know, that's something that I've learned after COVID. Mm. I, I, I put a plan in place after COVID where I said to myself, okay, if it gets to this point, then, you know, my tenure yeah. is going to stop. And it's important to recognize the signs and be aware of, of okay, well, now it's, it's time to go on to the next chapter. And, and then, you know, I think I also would tell my 37-year-old self is, it's not about getting as many cars as you want, as many boats and RVs and houses, and everything has to be big, 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 because that has a tremendous impact on on uh, on your uh, future too. Yeah. I mean, I've wasted. I know, you know, uh, I'm a big Jimmy Buffett fan. He has this song, you know, I made more money uh, that I could buy in Miami, but I pissed it all away. <laughs> so I, I, I did some bad things, you know, I bought a bunch of stuff and, yeah. and, and I realized, you know, you end up paying taxes and insurance and all that stuff and it just milks you dry. Yeah. So a lot of those bad decisions I probably shouldn't have done, yeah. but also you got to remember when you're in the height of your career, you want to have fun. Yeah. So there is also the fun factor in there. So you got to recognize that, well, you did all that because you had fun doing it. And, and every single thing you purchased was a, a victory or a milestone in your success that you could do that. But, uh, you know, I would say to my 37-year-old self, yeah, you know, you pump probably sh you, yeah, you should have pumped the brakes a little <laughs> earlier. Yeah. But I've had such a wonderful time. And, you know, like America for me, from being Danish, I mean, I could never have done what I've yeah. what I've done here so i've ha i've lived the american dream i really have i yep. mean i'm and i think that's why i i can sit here and say that you know now i want a smaller house i i don't want to mow 10 acres yeah and i want something that requires no maintenance i want to come home you know cook a good stew you know and then sit out on the back porch with a glass of wine and just say you know i'm happy we're doing it yeah we're doing it hey, would you would you say thinking is a big part of your deal you think a lot thinking yeah yeah i mean i think uh, as an entrepreneur you know you think all the time right. and i think that that's how you make it i mean it that's my the hardest part physically of being an entrepreneur is that you can't stop thinking yeah you're constantly you know i i solve all my problems when i'm trying to sleep yeah. and unfortunately the, i i wish there was a way around that right. but it's because you know i have the peace around me and you're saying okay tomorrow uh, this is happening. How do I prevent that from happening? And all that stuff. You're thinking about all those things, so you got to have a pen and paper next to you so you don't forget it the yeah. next day. But you know, I've come up with some brilliant ideas, like in the wee hours, yeah. 
and uh, and uh, you know, thinking is is what makes you going, and yeah. and 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 you know, you adapt to whatever they throw at you. Yeah, it's it's kind of a weird question, right? To say, do you think? I mean, of course, we all think, but I. I I think we keep saying the word think a lot. I believe that most I people think do, therefore I, think, I am there think therefore I am, which mm-hmm. is a great quote. I, but I believe that most people don't slow down enough to think, right? They, it was weird. I got to do this. Yeah. I got to do that. I, yeah. oh, I got this email. I got this meeting. I, I am a big believer. I've been saying it for years. Strategic think time, mm-hmm. slow down to speed up, put an hour and a half on your calendar. I have it on my calendar every week, hour and a half. I do nothing but this black journal, mm-hmm. an ink pen and me. That's yeah. it. Right. And I think, right. Purposeful time thinking. And that, mm-hmm. that's why I asked the question, because for me, it seemed like you are a thinker uh, without knowing you really well. But I, I think that you do that. And, well, and I mean, it's and, a big deal. and I think that, it, like you say, it's very important. So what, what I do is I get up in the morning before my three dogs and my wife and I uh, read the news. But lately, I, I have I've thought, you know, that I'm wasting so much time looking at Instagram and Facebook and, and Twitter and what other people say about the restaurant and what I do and the show and all that. I'm not thinking to myself, and now I watch this thing on my phone that tells you how much time you spend on your yeah. device, and it's scary. It is scary. It is so scary because, like you said, what if I was productive? And, I mean, I, you really don't need to look at your phone four hours a day. It's yeah. an, an absolute waste. Right. But most of us do. Because it's becoming the most important tool we have, yeah. but but it takes away from the thinking process that you used to do. It takes away with from the interacting you do with other people, and then you know I hate when people come to my restaurant. Four people they sit down and then they're all yeah. on their phones and yeah. they're not talking to each other. No and phone rule. Yeah. So, but but you know there is a lot of things. You, that you can't change, and this is one of the things yeah. that I know. I told my staff five years ago that they were not allowed to have any cell phones, mm. and I was losing staff. So then I had to, you know, change the rule where they can have a cell phone, right? Because they had all these reasons why they had to have the cell phone, and so there was just nothing you can do. You just yeah. completely lost control over that. But really, I mean, you don't. You you can you know look at your phone at your break, but everybody's so used to that instant. Yeah thing they have to have it have and and I, and i'm to blame myself too you know yeah. like uh you know everybody is a food critic now on on instagram and facebook okay. so you you gotta every morning look well of all the people that was in the restaurant yesterday yeah. uh, are they writing anything nice are they writing anything bad and and you just never know yeah, yeah. Uh, this is a shameless plug but this is the future grade uh, achieving a future grade than your past journal i created this it's now on amazon and for me Everything you're saying is exactly why I believe in pen and paper, right? Mm-hmm. The journaling, the strategic think time. I use this Focus 90. This is a 90-day deal. So I just started, you know, July, August, September. Mm-hmm. These 90 days in here. What are my goals? What am I Focus 90? Because to your point, we can start every morning and then all of a sudden there's an hour wasted, right? Yeah. You know, what the hell just happened, right? So Focus 90 is for the next 90 days, how can I spend the first 90 minutes of every day Focus mm-hmm. on these three or four or five things. Yeah, it may just be, hey, I want to do fifty push-ups a day. Yeah. right. Get up and do fifty push-ups. It may be I need to read ten pages. It may need I need to make a call to my loved one or whoever and just tell them I'm thinking about them. You know, things like that. And so that's why I think it's so important for us to think, journal, write down, dream, uh, and good things can happen. Because you're right, these phones are disastrous and can yeah. take advantage of our own time. We just yeah. let it happen. So. Um, so tell us again, food is love working listeners, find more of that and find more of you. Well, so, uh, food is love has now morphed into a, uh, we have our own YouTube channel called food is love TV. And, uh, I'm actually doing an ex- exciting project for the first time outside of PBS. I'm shooting a show outside of PBS and it was, uh, a, a, a gentleman that came to the restaurant and, uh, you know, He said, well, why don't you do an episode about Denmark or Danish food? Mm. And I'm like, well, you know, I haven't raised any money for it. And, you know, I I, have never really thought about that, but it's a really good idea. I would love to do it. And he said, well, I'll fund it. So that's a great opportunity because now what we're going to do is we're going to try to create an episode where I get to do and say whatever I want to do. 
So it's going to be a little different. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I'm still I'm still uh, uh, not sure what we're going to call it. But so the show on PBS is Food is Love. And I'm thinking about first I wanted to call it Food is Love Unhinged because yeah. I was unhinged. But I thought, no, that's little, little too drastic. So now I'm thinking Food is Love Stories. So that's I, I, I kind of like that because yeah. obviously I'm now I'm I my show has been a love letter to St. Louis mm -hmm. and now I got to write a love letter about my own country yeah. and you know uh, the food I had when I grew up and so I'm going back in August and I'm shooting a show and uh, it's in a, a collaboration with a with a producer over there that uh, um that I actually knew from 40 years ago. We hadn't seen each other for 40 years, and, and uh, it just happened. And I'm like, you know, we know each other. And he said, yeah, we, he said, uh, I taught, I tried to teach you how to play a electric bass when in high school. And I'm like, really? And uh, I was a chef uh, apprentice at the same time. And he said, I, 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 he said, after a few weeks, I remember thinking to myself, I should tell this man, stick to the cooking. This music <laughs> stuff music. is not for yeah. you. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, so here we are 40 years later. Yeah. We meet in Copenhagen. We talk about this program. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm now interacting with some people in my past. So I'm really looking forward to this. It's going to be an uh, unusual thing for us to do something yeah. outside of what we've been doing. So what I want to do is create an atmosphere uh, on Food is Love TV where you can not only see the shows there is on PBS, but you can also see some of these hand-picked episodes that I've decided yeah. I'm going to do, and I'm working on a couple of other ones. And uh, now we're going to try to see if we can go out and find funding for some of these other things. But at least we'll have this episode to tell people, see, yep. this is what the show could look like. If, if we did it in your yeah. city or your country or so. That's great. Yeah. I love it. I love it. And mm -hmm. where do we find more of you on uh, social media, website, anything like that? Uh, well, food is love TV mm -hmm. is our website. And, uh, uh, you know, now when we have time to think about it, I'm going to put up a donate button because it's very important to get donations mm -hmm. for food is love. So I, I hope, uh, uh, that people would think of that. And, uh, I'm planning a couple of, uh, um, fundraisers mm -hmm. and uh tony pietoso from cafe napoli oh, yeah. he is a great supporter of the show he was on my show episode one season two and uh, he opened another restaurant uh called napoli c and on august 14th we're gonna have 100 tickets out there it's 250 dollars a person and uh they, uh, he's going to create a huge menu and, uh, you know, the proceeds go to food is love. So love that'll that. be the first of many. And then we have planned, uh, I'm actually planning on doing an, uh, one in Alton, yep. Illinois at state street market, okay. which is, uh, the people that own that are originally from Carbondale. So we know each other from there and we're going to do a fundraiser in Alton, but those details are not settled yet, but you know, just, uh, follow me on Facebook Follow foodislove.tv on Instagram. Uh, I have uh, Instagram, I'm Chef Lasser. And, uh, you know, all of that stuff is going to come out. Awesome. We, we have some great things planned that we want to do. And, and uh, you know, really, uh, it's so important that we teach the new generation, I think, the importance of, of sitting down, dining together, uh, and, and sharing not only food but wine and atmosphere because that's love and that's the most important thing Amen. right that's right need more of it we need more of it yeah so last question this is from our friend abby over here your favorite thing to cook you had to, if you could only cook one thing what would it well be? so uh in my tenure in los angeles i worked at a hawaiian restaurant and i have this fish that i'm obsessed with and uh and i think as a foreigner or an immigrant coming into United States. And then I always wanted to go to Hawaii. So mm. all the names of the fish in, uh, in, uh, in Hawaii uh, excites me. So my favorite fish is opaka paka. Okay. And I created this dish with opaka paka. It has like stewed leeks and uh, sesame seeds, and it has an anise seed bar blanc. I love licorice. Licorice uh, is in anise seed. And so that's my, my favorite thing to cook. But being in the location I'm in here, I have not been able to cook it very often. So 
uh, one of my ideas for a show I have, if I can find the funding, is going to Hawaii because there's also a lot of stuff in Hawaii yeah. that intrigues me, and I'm very familiar with Hawaiian food, even though I haven't been there. So that's on my bucket list of, of shows, and uh, if I can get over there and yeah. cook some opaka paka, <laughs> uh, that'd that's be great. It. I bet Abby could show up and be there at the same time, and she'll be. Yeah. She'll, you'll at least have one person at the deal, right? <laughs> We're gonna have a ton of people, but Abby's gonna be there and have some of that. Well, it's been awesome having you, Chef, okay. and thanks so much for being with us. It, on the it was a pleasure. Success. It was a pleasure. Thank you. There we go. Love it.